Hey everybody, what is up? I hope you're having a great day. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and if you haven't, if you have not yet, uh, you know what I'd love from you? I'd love a, uh, an iTunes and Stitcher review. That'd be cool. Helps the show. Uh, I think more people need to be listening to what we have here. It's it's so funny. Um, people find the show, and uh, it, it's amazing. I, the, the emails I get are amazing. You, know, you guys are really awesome. And by the way, um, I've, I just talked with a guy who's been listening to me from the beginning, never, ever sent me an email. The guy's listened to, to, to literally hundreds of hours of me talking and never sent me an email. So look, if you're, like, if you're out there, uh, reach out, say what's up. I read all my email and I respond to 99% of it. I don't, the only ones I don't respond to are, are really long emails asking me a ton of questions. And I look, I love the stories. I just don't have time to, uh, to, uh, you know, write back three pages. Okay. Um, look, 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 today's guest. I don't know if you know this, but I'm working very hard to mix it up. Right? I want to find people who are out there doing 60, 70 deals uh, as well as six, 700 deals. Um, you know, sometimes you guys hear the stories of those people that are doing you know, a gajillion deals and you're like, ah, geez, I can't relate. Um, so I'm trying to mix it up. Now, today's guest is a pretty, it's a pretty amazing story. Um, let me tell you, let me just talk about volume production really quickly. Um, um, and, and I want to let you know whoever you are, whatever, look, you guys can achieve great things. All right. Um, today's guest is, look, he's a great guy. He's a nice guy. He's not, he's not Einstein. Um, but look, his first year, he did 8 million. Second year, 24 million. Third year, 84 million. One, two, three. Fourth year, 138 million. And his fifth year in business, he'll do $250 million. Five years in business, $250 million. You know what he did before that? This guy sold jewelry. Jewelry. Five years later, the dude's doing $250 million. Um, pretty, pretty amazing. So, so we're going to get into, into what this guy did. And I, I'll tell you what he did is very non-real estate-y. Um, you know, most people, when they think about and start a real estate business, uh, number one, they make the mistake of not treating it like a business from day one. That's, that's the first mistake. But then the second mistake is, you know, people look to other real estate agencies' business um, for, you know, in order to model that. And what this guy did is he looked outside the world of real estate. Uh, he went and looked at corporate America and said, okay, what do the companies on, you know, the Inc 500, all right, the fortune 100, 500 companies, what do they do? How do they start? And, and, and he, that's what, that's exactly what he modeled. You know, he modeled, uh, I won't, I won't tell you in the intro here, the steps, we talk about the steps, we talk about some of the things he does. So, um, so I'm, sh I, I, I liked it. I had fun with it. So I'm sure. And I hope you do too. Now, a couple things, <clears throat> a couple things, this is going live on Friday. Now, um, as I told you guys, Tuesday, I'm actually in Portland. I'm sorry, Seattle right now. Um, well, not right now, but when this airs, it's, uh, I'm going to be in Seattle. Um, so I'm hanging out in Seattle for a couple days. I'm going to a conference, uh, trying to hopefully sign some radio folks up. And then I'm going to spend three days with my daughter uh, on Mount Rainier. So we have a little bit of a trip coming. So I'm leaving tomorrow morning at 630, uh, or I'm leaving to my house at five. Uh, but so Tuesday's episode, Tuesday the 29th, we are not going to air uh, a spot or an episode. So it'll give you a good chance to, to go back and look into the archives. Um, um, okay, let's get to it. I'm going to run before we I'm going to run something by you guys. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? 
My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. Yeah. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate yeah. entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. So a little bit of housekeeping really quickly. My Twitter handle is at Super Agents Live. The show hashtag is Unpack That Idea. I'd love to see you on Twitter. Um, uh, and, and if you're not following me, follow me. Um, uh, and I'll follow you back. Um, I, wanna, I want your opinion, okay? I'm, I, I, I have been doing the show for a while. I don't sell you guys anything. You know, every other podcaster does. I don't do uh, commercials except for our own stuff. Um, but I do want to add value to your lives, to your businesses. Um, and the best way that I can do that, I think, or, or my most recent idea how, how I can do that is give you guys access to these calls. So instead of you guys just tuning in to listen to them, what if I did one call a week, we did it on GoToMeeting, so you could see me, you could see my guest, and you could ask us questions. Um, what do you guys think about that? Would you tune in? If it was Thursdays, 10 a.m. Pacific, would you guys tune in? And, and, and who would you like me to have as guests? And, uh, and, uh, is that compelling as a product? Um, cause that's going to be a ton of work for me. Uh, you know, I have to pay for the go-to meeting stuff. So that's something I'd have to charge for. So let me know. I, I, I don't want to set it up and only have, you know, 10, 15 people do it. Uh, you know, I, I ideally would love for, you know, a hundred, uh, I'd have to think about that. Actually, I would have to limit the size cause I couldn't have a hundred cause we couldn't ask that many questions. Interesting. Maybe you guys get access to the call and maybe it's some sort of premium feature that allows you to ask questions. I don't know. Maybe we, we do it on a rotating basis. Um, okay, let me know. All right, hey, let's get to today's guest. He's awesome. Lance Loken. Lance, thanks for taking the time out, man. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, listen, I know your story. Your name has come up on the show a few times. Um, but uh, for those who, who are not familiar with you, um, tell us a little bit about yourself personally, Lance. I want to know a little bit about your background, and then we're going to get into what you're doing. Sure. Um, most of my career has been as a C-level executive and mostly in the retail industry. I was a CFO for most of my career with a finance background. And then most recently, right before real estate, I was in the renewable energy sector with wind turbines. Okay. So when you say retail, that's interesting, you know, cause, because, you know, you having a, a background in retail, I mean, at the end of the day, reselling real estate, you, you, that's retail as well. Your product just happens to be houses instead of, uh, instead of jewelry. A hundred percent agree. So, okay. What, what just, so everybody has an idea when you say retail, what, what were you selling? What were you the CFO of? Um, Francesca's Collections, uh, which is based in Houston, Texas. Before that, I was in the furniture retail business with um, a company in Texas, and then before that, in the Northeast, uh, in the Philadelphia region. Uh, we had stores in the East Coast and West Coast. Okay. Now, you know, you being a CFO, you have a background in finance. Um, and I think, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, Lance, that's, that's what you majored in in college, right, finance? Yes, that's correct. To, to talk about numbers just a little bit, because he, here's what I believe that you did, Lance, and this is this is what you know. I this is a common trait of all top performers like you. When you set out to build your business, you set out to build a business, and you treated it like a business. Um, how did that background in finance, you being a numbers guy, kind of give you an edge starting off uh, in that regard? Well, the fir- the first objective was to look at who the top producers were in the. Uh, real estate industry specifically with Keller Williams and then set out a six year plan in how to attain that level and looked at the figures and basically created a vision based off of those figures. And the first thing that we did was created a mission, vision and value statement right up front. 
Okay, so so you touched on something really important, right? So you went to the top guys, uh, or you found and looked at the top guys at Kate Keller Williams, and then you modeled them. You know it, it, how uh, it, that's intriguing to me because um, you know in the world of real estate at large, there are very few people that have. I mean, I literally have had one guy on the show that beat you with twelve hundred. It's a Coldwell guy, and I've had a lot of people doing seven hundred transactions, but not eleven. How did you, in terms of finding those people and modeling them, how, like walk us through sort of your thought process around mixing and matching, you know what I mean? Taking what is good from here, you know, and taking what is good from there and putting them all in one pot. Uh, so from a vision standpoint, I looked at the top producers to see what their volume was and their number of units and then backtracked to current day. So back in 2011, when we first got into the business, looked at what we could potentially do the first year of business. And then the goal was by 2017 to be the top producer in the Houston market uh, based off of those figures. So from a volume standpoint, looked at the top producers numbers from a business standpoint, I relied heavily on past experience and corporate America structure and built the business with that kind of a model and mindset. Okay. Um, now, you said a minute ago that you, the first thing you did, you, you started with a mission statement, a, a, a vision statement. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and why that was the first building block that you started with? Sure, uh, because you know, at the end of the day, you have to have your reason why you're in the business and what you're going to accomplish. So basically, the why, what, who, how, and and create that so that you have a game plan in place. Most people just go into business and haphazardly think at the end of the day, if I work hard, I'm going to accomplish something. I wanted to have a plan in place from day one to get to a goal. And uh, one of the attributes that I feel like I possess that has helped us a lot is being very goal-oriented and driven. So when we were creating the team, and business model started from day one with a goal end in mind. Okay, so you started with your why, your, you started with your goal, your end in mind. Um, I, here's what I'm trying to touch on, and I want to get into just the, the mechanics, the nuts and bolts of that, but how does a guy like you envision a model and a business that – that almost nobody's attained. That's why, you know, how does a guy like you think bigger than what, what, you know, everybody in the, tw- you know, how many agents in KW? 250,000? And you looked and said, Man, I'm going to be. There's a, yeah, there's, there's 125,000 Keller Williams agents. And then just in the Houston market of all real estate agents, there's over 27,000. Okay. So, but again, you, you didn't say, oh, geez, the, the top guys are doing 500 deals. You know, you said, I'm going to do. 12, I mean, look, what is your goal? What, you, what is your 2017? Tell us that goal that you, that you want to achieve. In 2017, we're going to do 425 million and um, we'll do about 1500 transactions. Um, we have, we have our plan laid out through 2025. So in 2020, we're going to do a billion dollars in volume. Wow. And in 2025, we'll have done $2 billion in volume. That's amazing, man. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think more people should know your story, Lance. And um, and I, you know, I don't know why Forbes hasn't written done something on you, or have they? <laughs> well, we we just uh, received notification that we're in the Inc. Five Thousand, so uh, we achieved three hundred and three in the Inc. Five Hundred. So we were pretty excited about that. Okay. So, um, but we're. I mean. We're trying to be solution based and take care of our clients at the end of the day. Yeah. And yes, we have big goals. Um, but if we feel like if we continue to be solution based, that those goals are going to take care of themselves. Okay. So, so again, let's get into the nuts and bolts of it. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I believe, and I could be wrong about some of this, Lance, but I believe your first year you did 24 million. The second year, no, our first, our, our first year we did eight million. Okay. In 2011, we did eight million. Then in our second year, we did $24 million. Okay. Our third year, we did $84 million. And last year, we did $138 million. This year, in our fifth year of business, we're, we're on track to do about 230 to $250 million. Okay. 
Amazing, man. So, so from the, you know, the 8 million, that's, that's good. That's not stellar. I mean, you know what I mean? That's, 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 that can be done, but going tripling, going from eight to 24, what do you attribute? Um, what does it take to go from eight to 24? What was the sort of secret sauce there for you? Um, the first year of business focused on the buyers and really trying to understand buyers. And also I had no idea about the real estate industry, so I didn't know any better. Um, that second year the light bulb went off and said, if I do listings, maybe I can, you know, achieve both sides of the transactions or, you know, have more buyers involved. So that second year of business really focused on the listings and that's how we got to the 24 million. And then in our third year of business, we focused on builder relations mm. because in the Houston market, there's a lot of new construction. So we focused on that. And the overriding theme in each year is that we focused on one large idea and then built upon that the following year. So first year was buyers, second year was sellers, third year was builder. Then we got into radio and TV in our fourth year. This year our focus has been on luxury and then uh, we're, we have another focus for next year. And and uh, I, I won't ask you to share that, just... just uh... Um, okay. So now as we know, I mean, you can do all the right stuff, right? You can have all the marketing out there, have tons of people boots on the ground, but you need to have, there's no way you could, you could achieve any, this scale in this time frame without having bulletproof systems in place. Talk to us a little Absolutely bit. Absolutely agree. Yeah, yeah. So talk to us a little bit about that. Cause I think that's, that's something a lot of people struggle with is, you know, what are those systems? Well, you know, how, how do I develop them? So maybe just give us your thesis on that. And then I want to jump into radio. Sure. No problem. The, the first thing I did in that first year of business was found somebody that did have real estate experience uh, from a transaction standpoint. And she was my first hire. And ultimately she was the one and only person that ever had real estate experience. The rest of the people on our team all come from corporate America and do not have real estate experience. So I think that has really set us apart as well. But from the system standpoint, um, our vice president of operations handled all of the transactions, set systems in place whereby we could um, run our business at a high efficiency manner. And then we hired like-minded people from industries that did a lot of high volume transactionally and brought them into the real estate industry. And our back office staff is unbelievable. They do an absolutely amazing job. We have manuals for each position so that if anybody new comes in, they can look at our operations manual and take it and run with it. You know, I think, Lance, you touch on something that I think is really important, and I think it's overlooked a lot. I think when people go out to build their real estate business, they only look at the world of real estate. And I think, you know, you sharing with everybody that, you know, you went outside the world of real estate and, you know, and, and tapped into people with, uh, with uh, skill sets um, that could be useful and just, and just migrated them to real estate. Um, it, was that, again, I think that's something unusual. Um, was that just something that you just luckily happened on or, or you know, how did you, how did you do again? That's unusual. How did you do that? Why did you think to do that? Um, I, I was very purposeful in accomplishing that. And the reason was, was because everywhere I um, looked, every person that was in the real estate industry that I spoke to was so concerned about real estate splits and commission splits yeah. and, you know, you keep hearing this time and time again, and I'm like, why are you guys so focused on splits? Don't you want to know what you want to make at the end of the year? And why not be focused on the salary that you're going to earn? And it it made me very frustrated. So I immediately went towards corporate America and searched for talent versus looking for real estate people. Okay. What, you know, I, I, it, it's, it's funny that, you know, people like you, you're, you know, you're an educated guy and listen, man, we've been recording for 13 minutes and you are all business. I mean, you are, you are, you get to it without messing around. 
How did you get those people, Lance, to – how did you convince them to go into real estate? Because – and here's, here's why, right? A lot of people, I think, if you have an MBA, you look down on real estate, and mainly because – um, you know, there's zero barrier, fundamentally zero barrier to entry. And, and, you know, and that because of that low barrier to entry it attracts, um, t- typically lower quality people. How did you get those people to, how did you convince them to come on board, uh, with you and in real estate? That was a, that was a key thing right from day one. Um, and I feel like because we had a mission, vision and value statement, and we could provide that value proposition to business, corporate business mentality. Um, I think we were able to relate to them very well. And yes, it was difficult, especially in the beginning, to to create buy-in because here I am telling people that this is what we were going to accomplish over the next several years. And this is how we were going to accomplish it. And I need, I need high minded people to come with me and leave businesses where they were making $150,000 a year and believe in this model for a couple of years before they were going to get back to earning that. But because we were so solution based and solution minded, I think that really assisted and because they bought into the belief in our culture and what we were going to accomplish. But it was difficult in the beginning. Um, fortunately, we were able to find people that had the same culture and goals that we had from a business perspective. And it, I, I'll take my team up against anybody. They are absolutely amazing. Yeah, and I think it's also a testament to to your leadership skills. I mean, ha- I mean, that's, it has to be. I mean, you have to be you, Lance. I mean, you know, you clearly are a good leader to have to have uh, done that convincing job. So, let's again, let's go back a little bit to to how you've structured your back office uh, and and some of those systems that uh, that that you have in place. And and primarily, you know, I want you to kind of imagine that you're talking to somebody that that is doing. 20 deals and they want to get to 50 deals. Um, what are some of those early systems that they should have in place in order to scale? Um, the, the biggest overriding thing that I felt like was unique for us is that whatever I was not good at, which is quite a few items that I ca- found people that could complement that. So whatever I was not good at, I wanted people that were experts in those areas so that, at the end of the day, we were one well-oiled machine. So when you're looking, um, most people that are in real estate have a sales mentality because that's what real estate is, is it's sales. So they look at everything from a sales perspective. If you look at um, what are they lacking, usually people in sales are lacking follow-up skills, they're lacking paperwork skills, and so... I wanted people that were experts at those type of skill sets. So people that are doing 20 deals and they want to get to 50 deals, they should have an assistant that is phenomenal at paperwork so that it allows them to go out and focus on what they're really good at, which is selling a product. Okay. And I think, I mean, have you read, uh, have you, because this is, you know, E-Myth, Michael Gerber, have you read that book? Uh, yes. Yeah. So I mean, this is that whole book. I mean, the, what you just explained is that whole book. So here's what here's what people often find themselves in when when they start growing a business. They start, you know, they they start off as solopreneurs. It's just them. They and and they, you know, if they are good salespeople and they have some hustle, um, they'll quickly get to a point where they they know they can't keep up with everything that is going that they have going on, you know, and still maintain uh, prospecting as well as good follow up. But they believe that they don't have enough work to hire this person or that person. So there's always this, there's always, they find themselves. Um, and, and I oftentimes have found myself in this situation where, you know, I don't have enough capa- capacity for me to do the work and I don't have enough work for, to, to, to um, justify hiring another 30, 40, $50,000 person. And therefore, you know, my growth gets stunted. In fact, I'm in, I'm actually in that situation right now. How how would you uh, how would you coach me around that, or or somebody else that's in that they find themselves in that position? First and foremost, you figure out what you want to accomplish and lay out the game plan on how to accomplish that 
for instance, the number of transactions that you're currently doing, are you performing at 50% of capacity? Are you performing at 75% of capacity? And look and try to project what it's going to take. How much more can you handle? And if you do that for the next one, three, and five years down the road, you can say, okay, I know right now that I need to hire this person so that I can do this much business. And um, it can be part-time to start out with. Yeah. I remember back in the second year of business, I knew that we needed a marketing person very badly in order to uh, differentiate ourselves from the rest of the industry. And so I hired somebody on a 10 hour a week um, basis in order to, to start doing the marketing. My goal, and she laughed at me because I kept writing her for six months. I, my goal was to have her full time by September the 1st. And she kept saying, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And she was in corporate America, but September 1st, she started on full time with the marketing side of the business. And at that time, we were busy enough that we could afford her to be full time. So you always have to be planning ahead. And I don't plan ahead by a month or two. I'm planning out six, 12 months ahead of time. And whoever we're hiring today, we're hiring to start producing January, February, and March of next year. We're not hiring today from a position of being frantic and saying, I can't, I can't keep up with this. I need to hire somebody. I'm looking at next year. How many people do I need next year? I need to hire them now so that they're fully operational by next year when I will need them. Got it. it got it. Man, I, and I'm hearing this, you know, I, I just, you're so deliberate, right? So, and you've said that a few times, right? You, you, you have intention, you, you're purposeful, you're deliberate, and you, you, you know, you are ahead of the curve. You're in, you're seeing that. Again, I'm seeing sort of Napoleon Hill here, right? I mean, if you can see it, you know, and you're planning for it, you're going to get there. Okay. So now, so let's, let's talk about marketing because, you know, I, you know, real estate is a contact sport, right? You got to go out, you got to make contacts, you got to follow up, you got to build relationships. Um, again, first to second year, you've tripled eight to 24 million and then, then a staggering 24 to, to, uh, 84. What, what, uh, what, when you brought that marketing person on, what did, what did she do? What, what, what did that look like that first 10 hours and then, and then into full time? Sure. Um, the, the funny thing is the first year of business, we did not have any money and, and people, um, tend to think that you know, because of our numbers that we had all these resources, financial resources up front, we did not. And one of the first things that I implemented was a website, which was the And from day one, I wanted to have the most professional looking website. And my wife kept saying, why in the world do you want to be spending money that we don't have on a website that we don't need? And I said, because three and five years down the road when people are recognizing the Loken group and they go to our website, it's going to set us apart and people are going to say, wow. And that's what I wanted from a marketing standpoint, because we had to differentiate ourselves immediately for the growth that was going to come down the road. So we did that first and foremost. Secondly, when Jennifer, our vice president of marketing came in and started working we started out small. We had brochures that were made and it's kind of funny. You look at the brochures that were made, you know, before she came along and after she came along, it's like night and day from a professional standpoint. Um, and then we started growing from that point. We started out with the brochures. Then we started marketing with the quality of the photographs and she added her expertise there we started doing some mailers and she added her expertise from that standpoint. And it just kept growing um, as we continue to grow the business. Okay. So, um, so you have, you, so you build, you spend money on this website. That you kind of maybe didn't really have, you, you, you do uh, some mailers, you, you do some brochures. What did you like on the, specifically on the brochures? Um, I'm not, you know, in terms of differentiating yourself, I'm not sure. I, I don't get that. I don't know how. How did you use those? Okay. Uh, the brochures we would put inside the home because we didn't want to have 
pamphlet sitting outside the home because then the prospective client would never get inside the home uh, because they'd see those pieces of paper. Yeah. We wanted to get people into the home so that the home could sell itself. So first and foremost, we had those brochures inside the house. Secondly, the quality of those brochures, we wanted to make sure that they were the same types of brochures that were in million dollar homes. So we had heavier stock paper. We had professional photography on there. We had um, very contemporary type of a brochure that was clean, that was concise, that was very strategic in uh, the way we were trying to approach our uh, candidates to come into the home. So we wanted that at the end of the day, you wanted to have that wow factor no matter what. So the brochures were a differentiating, a differentiating factor. Secondly, our listening presentations, they were water bound. They were first class all the way. And so when we were doing our listening presentations, people would look at those booklets and go, wow, this is impressive. Mm. And wherever we were able to do that wow factor, that's what we focused on. Okay, I got it. And I think I think one important thing, Lance, that I want to point out to, to the audience listening is, and what you did is, you know, with those brochures, you didn't have them outside, you had them inside. And I think that the, the important point of that is, is you held something back in order to get them to the next step, which in your case, in, in this case, get them inside the home. And, and another example of this is, you know, you can doing a Facebook post, I'm sorry, a, uh, um, uh, Craigslist post, right? Have great pictures, but don't tell them the price, right? Make them engage you. So I think that's an important point. Um, okay. So you have your systems, you're, you're bringing people on board, um, you know, as, as needed 10 hours, whatever. Um, and then you do radio. And so we got, we got you from 84 to now 138. Now what, talk to us a little bit about radio specifically. How, was that a, was that a game changer for you guys? It was. It was the next layer in the evolution of our business. So from day one, we wanted to cover the entire Houston metropolitan area, which covers nine counties. So strategically, when we were laying out our business model and business plan, we wanted to cover the entire Houston market. So when we were in our third year of business and developed a relationship with one of the top builders in town, we were able to put our signs in front of those homes and list those homes. So that created exposure. What it also forced us to do was start having a presence in multiple accounts. At the end of the day, we needed to market ourselves to multiple counties. And you can't really do that economically via postcards and mailers and things like that. It's just too many people. So I spoke with a couple of the top producers in the real estate industry, mainly Mark Spain, uh, which really helped me overcome the obstacle of getting into radio and TV because it was a great expenditure. expenditure. Um, I, I committed to doing it for about a year. The first six months, I was spending $12,000 a month, so $60,000. And our first closing was on an $80,000 mobile home. And I was like, you know, I'm spending all this money <laughs> yeah. and this is what we're getting. But I stayed committed and I knew that at the end of the day, it was going to work because it was working for so many of the other top producers. And I knew I needed to stick with it. We're now up to a three and four to one ratio on our return on investment. So we've overcome that deficit and now we've made up you know, to get to this level. So at the end of the day, it was hugely successful, but did not have the money up front in order to accomplish that. And so created for a lot of stressful days in the beginning. Yeah. And I, and I think if I, if I, if I've heard your story, right, I, I, it took that $80,000, the first deal was 80 grand, but it took you like four months of, of being on the radio, spending 20, I'm sorry, 12 grand a month to get there. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. We we didn't close on that property until the sixth month, so sixty thousand up front, and then One you know deal. we started to get more residual business. But yeah, that first closing, you know, didn't really put a dent into the expenses that we were incurring. And 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 
so so this 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 radio piece and your geography is going to be key into to, into my next step here in talking about how, you building your expansion teams. But help me understand in the audience: at what point do you do you feel like you uh, in in what month do you feel like with radio that you reach the tipping point and then it started to to gain steam and you know get a four to one ratio? The the six month I think really started to you you could start seeing the floodgates open, we were getting more and more phone calls. It took a good year before we were able to break even. And now uh, we've been doing it for two years now and we're up to the, you know, about three and a half to one ratio. Okay. Now here's the, here's, as you know, Lance, um, and again, we're going to get into your expansion team, you know, radio works best in smaller markets. It gets, you know, when you get to larger geographies like Dallas, I built a radio campaign for um, your buddy, Russell Rhodes. Um, and he was yeah. very concerned about the, the big reach of it. And because, you know, with radio, you, you know, you got this 200 mile reach, 100 mile reach and you, you can't cover it. So you're spending all this money that you can't cover. So I think this moves us now into your 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 model of of building expansion teams. Um, talk to us a little bit about that and, and how that has uh, how that has impacted your numbers and how that's going to impact your, you know, your billion dollar uh, goal for 2021. Um, sure. So th- when you look at the Houston region, um, I basically separated it by the main interstate highways. So I, I separated it into five regions. I had the Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, and Southwest regions. And then inside the loop, which is basically the inner city of Houston, which is its own animal, which I think most cities have, you know, the inner city where Either people absolutely want to live or they absolutely don't want to live. So separating it into those five regions um, really worked out well for us. And then we wanted to make sure that we had expertise in those areas. So started hiring people that lived in those areas, and that's how we created our expansion model. We had the five regions, and we had people that lived in each of those five regions, and they could become experts in those regions. And how many how many different teams do you have in in Houston? Well, we have five different regions and five right. different teams. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and so we have we have one listing agent for every three buyer agents. That's the that's the model that we're going to be adhering to. And okay, okay, and. Um, and again, Houston's a big. Uh, do, do you have goals? And I don't know if you want to share them, but do you have uh, uh, goals to you know take it to Dallas, take it to you know like cover all of Texas, or even get into you know out of state like uh, you know like somebody like a Lisa Archer's trying to do? Yeah, our model is a little different. Um, we from day one, my game plan has been for our team to have fifteen percent market share, because from a retail perspective. Once you hit 15% market share, you flooded the market. And so that has always been our goal. Well, to do 15% market share in the Houston region is about 30,000 transactions in a year. Wow. So I think we'll be just fine with our five regions or our five expansion. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would imagine. So that's interesting. So, so if you can capture fifteen percent market sh- share, y- you have because and, and here's when you said that I was thinking. You know, if somebody has a farm, let's say it's a thousand house, two thousand three, whatever, whatever their farm size is, does that fifteen percent number hold true for a smaller geography like a a neighborhood or a farm? Yes, I absolutely believe it does. And if I was in a smaller market and controlled fifteen percent market share. I would absolutely be expanding like people like Lee Archer does. Got it. Because I feel like then you own that market and you need to expand to another market. Just like, you know, Walmart, they started out, you know, in one location. And when they expanded, they expanded very close by until they owned 15% market share in each of those areas. And then they continued to go. But it was over a several years time span. It wasn't just a once and done thing. And if you look at Walmart, they started out in a remote location, and as they expanded, they did it very close so that it was reachable until they finally expanded outside of the state and then went into global. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, 
you know, look, Lance, I mean, you're, you're a smart guy. You're a driven guy. You have big ideas, big goals, and, and I'm confident you're going to get there. But um, t- tell me something. You know, what do you know now, right, after all this, you know, all your professional experience, what do you know now that you wish you would have known when you started? That people are as instrumental as they are, uh, and it's the right talent. If you have the right talent, you can do anything you want to accomplish. Um, and we are 100% team oriented. So everything that we accomplish is as a team. All of our goals are made as a team. We do everything together. And one person's not more important than the other. We do have an executive team. However, they're there to lead and guide and hold accountable each of the other um, team members. But from day one, you have to realize that your talent is the most important piece of your business. Okay. And I, and I, I, I want to talk a little bit about culture and, and your thoughts on it. But, um, but I'm curious, I'm curious, Lance, you know, with your corporate brat background, um, you know, did you, and it sounds, you know, you build this very much like a, like a, like a, a regular corporation might. Did you also, did you create a, a, a board of advisors and, 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 you know, do you, do you, tr- is it as formal as that or no? Yes, it is. You do? So, okay. Yeah, I, have, I have I have a corporation. I have a, um, a board of directors. I have an executive committee. Um, wow. It, it is truly 100% a business model. I mean, you, you heard me say earlier, I have a vice president of buyer agents, a vice president of listing agents, vice president of marketing, of operations. They are all corporate titles and that's how we operate the business. Okay. That's great. I mean, that's again, you're unusual in that, in that regard. So, so you have a board of directors that you meet now, this board of directors, are they multi uh, industry? I mean, do you have people from retail, from real estate, from building manufacturing? Do do, do you, do you have, uh, have you created your board um, in that like that? That's a bad question. Yes. None of them have a real estate uh, background. Okay. Now, so, and they're all C-level executives, so I relate to them very well, you know, yeah, from that perspective. So, so on that, I mean, did, how about, uh, how, you know, like most startups these days, they go out and they raise money, right? You get venture money, you, you know, you get angel money. Um, did, you, did you ever consider to, to ramp up uh, faster? Did you ever consider to going outside and, and giving equity for dollars? No, because I wanted to have a debt-free business and operate from a debt-free perspective. And um, I feel very firmly that we should not be doing things if we don't have the funds for them. At the same time, I do believe that if we do the necessary research and we're confident that we we should take the leap of faith, per se, you know, like I did with radio and TV, but we're very strategic in how we accomplish that. Um, but I, I have no desire nor interest in going too quickly just because I have the funds to do it. I want to make sure that first and foremost, we have the right talent in place in order to accomplish the goals that we want. If we don't have the right talent, then it's not worth growing big because five years from now, we would have grown too fast and not had the correct talent in place, yeah. and we'd crumble. Absolutely, at that one hundred percent. So, so um, I'm going to ask you a question that I'm interested in, and, and I, I, I don't know if the I, I don't want to lose any of the audience right now. But you know, you're very goal oriented. You started with the end in mind. Um, I know that you want to get to a billion dollars. Um, what is your What is your exit strategy here? I I. My entire goal and what I get up every morning to do is to run this business and to enable everybody on the team to accomplish their goals because at the end of the day, if they accomplish their goals, then my goals will be accomplished. And that is my number one focus on a daily basis. Okay. I do have an executive team, and if anything, God forbid, did happen, I have six people right now that could take over this business and run it like I'm not even there. Um, the beauty of that is 
with having a great bench like that and allowing them to run their departments from a business perspective, I can see on a daily basis who's going to rise to the top and who's going to stay status quo. And from that executive team, my replacement can be in place because I get to watch them on a daily basis and how they run a business. That's, that's fantastic. I, I, I appreciate you sharing that, that, that you do have that, uh, you know, that you can step out of the business. I think that's, that's, that's awesome. Okay. So let's go back to culture a little bit. We'll just, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but you know, you, you, you are very, you sound very much people first, people first, team first. What, give us your, uh, your viewpoint, your philosophy, your thesis, however you want to say it on, on building a good culture. I think early on, even in, when I was in junior high and high school, I saw that people in leadership roles that were more dictatorial, dictatorship yep. style, they tended to have people follow them out of fear and out of necessity. And I never wanted to be that type of a person. I do feel like I have leadership qualities. I mean, I was class president my freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior high school years. And I found that when I served them, that they appreciated that so much more. And you have a, you have a loyalty that's automatically created. And so I think I've taken that, you know, throughout business, the entire career, um, more of a coaching mentality and more of a serving mentality. Because at the end of the day, if your people are loyal to you, you don't have to spend umpteen thousands of dollars training new people on a daily basis. You create that loyalty and they want to stay with you and they want to work with you because they believe in what you're believing in. I think at the end of the day, that's much more important than just throwing a bunch of money at somebody and saying, okay, go do this. Got it. Yeah. That's, you know, uh, I would agree with you. I, you know, you know, Don, uh, uh, um, Scarface, right? Al Pacino, he, he asked that question. Is it better to be feared or loved? Um, and I think Sun Tzu um, uh, attacked this a little bit in his, uh, in his, his book. Um, yeah, okay, be servant-hearted. I love it. So, so uh, we're going to have to start wrapping up. I've had you on for 40 minutes. I appreciate your time. But what is, uh, what's one thing that's working for you right now in your business? Our, the addition, from day one, we've had inside sales force. We've added to that inside sales force. Uh, we're now up to 10 people on a regular basis. Those people are inside the office calling on a daily basis and really developing our database for future growth. Um, and that's actually our focus for next year. Is our We call it our data bank. And it's funny because Mark Spain said data bank a couple of years ago by mistake when he was on stage with somebody and, and Lisa Archer and I were talking and, and he said, you know, data bank. And we're like, that is such an awesome idea because at the end of the day, that's really what they are. And so next year our focus is on the data bank and focus on developing the data bank to um, generate a lot more business. And that'll be our next one thing for next year. Got it. Okay, so yeah, so you're, that's a bank, right? You're, you know, it's, it's a data, database. It's a bank. You know, there's there's right. money in that list. Um, so so and, and, and you don't have to be spending thousands of dollars to market to them because they know your model already and they've they've seen what you've done. So why not focus your efforts on that because it'll be a lot less costly and you're not wasting your money on people like Trilly and Zillow that. Are, you're paying for the leads that you should have already had in the first place. Yeah. So those just just so um, you know, if somebody wants to kind of model what you're doing somewhere else, um, these people they're doing outbound calls to to what they're they're, they're getting a, a list. Like, what are those outbound calls? How are they getting that list? Let me. That's maybe a better way to ask it. Most of the outbound calls are FISBOs and expireds. Um, FISBOs is for sale by owner. Um, the other piece and. I thought this was a genius thing and an analogy. Um, ben Kinney spoke about a year and a half ago. Uh, this gentleman that was 
watching his business and how it was operating and said, Ben, I want your leads. I want your leads. And, and Ben had him come into the office one day and he said, you get me five appointments out of this list and by lunchtime and we'll go to lunch and discuss everything. And so he accomplished five appointments that morning and he was all excited. These, li- these leads are so awesome. This is the best thing in the world. <laughs> let, let me have more for the afternoon. And Ben Kinney gets back to his office and he says to his executive assistant, hey, will you give this guy the next page out of the white pages? Right. <laughs> and, and, and it's as simple as that. So we have our people calling, you know, people that are cold leads as well. That is a great story, right? Um, okay. So, you know, in your personal, um, in, in your, for you, uh, you know, and, and you, you know, Ben Kinney, Mark Spain, all these are folks that, that have, uh, you know, Ben Kinney was named, I think, last year by Inman, you know, one of the most innovative marketers. You know, Mark Spain is, is consistently a top guy. He works with, uh, with uh, hedge funds or, uh, um, so again, unique things um, for you, Lance, in your personal or professional development, who has been a mentor to you along the way? Um, the, the person outside of the real estate industry that's been the most impactful for me is David Rubin. Um, he's a Harvard graduate. He actually has a standing invitation at any time to speak to anybody at the school. And um, he's extremely hyper as I am. Um, and he's so intuitive and intelligent. And um, I've used him to bounce ideas off for the past 10 years. And he's absolutely amazing. Okay, so I asked that question to know uh, to, to to then follow up with this. Everybody, I get emails all the time. You, you, I mean, you should see how many emails I get, and people go, "Hey, Toby, will you mentor me? Will you mentor me?" And I don't, I can't do it. Right? I mean, I just, I don't have, I don't have that much time. Um, how does somebody find a mentor, right? Like a Ben Kinney or yourself or a Mark Spain? How, how do you get those? How do you how do you build a mentor relationship like that? What's the best way in in how would you coach someone to to, to do that? The beautiful thing about Keller Williams is that they have a Maps coaching program already in place, and uh, Keller Williams last year was ranked the number one training program in the world, and so. If you're in that environment, you can use MAPS coaching. I actually have a MAPS coach, and I have every executive on my team. They also have a MAPS coach. So find people not that are doing your level. You want to find people that are above your level and get mentored by them because then they can see the light at the end of the tunnel for you and help you guide, help guide you through that process. I like to talk to people that are outside of the industry that are more executive and business minded and as well as having somebody inside the industry from an executive standpoint as well. So I surround myself with people that are 10 times better than I am. So, but okay. So, so, and it's, it's funny maps, you know, um, I had a few conversations with Dana uh, Kokoska. I can never say her name right. Um, and she would not come on this show. She felt like with what we do here, because because basically you right now are coaching you know the people listening she felt like we were um we were her competition i said it's free we don't like we don't and and i couldn't get her in she's like no you coach and i'm like okay okay talking about you lance i mean you're this guy you know you're on this you you know you've had this meteoric rise nobody's done what you've done in this short a time why does somebody why do you somebody like you even have a coach i mean i don't i don't what 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 does somebody like you lance get from coaching um, I guess I'll answer the question by asking this. Yeah. Why should NFL football players have a coach? Yeah. No, you're right. Why should why should a Tiger and, Woods have a coach? Exactly. And if those people have coaches, um, and if Diana Kokoska and Gary Keller and Mark Willis, if all those people have coaches, then why in the world am I even questioning it? Right. 100%. I, so, that's a great way. Right. And, and you're absolutely correct. In the beginning, I kept saying, why do I need to have a coach? I've got, you know, all this corporate experience and everything else. I've been mentored all through my life. But at the end of the day, if all, all these great people are still being coached to this day, then why am I even questioning it? I absolutely have to have a coach. And just like you said, Tiger Woods, 
he has a coach to this day, and he he was at the top of his game for many many years. Yep. No, I I appreciate you saying that because I think more people, more people, man, should go out and 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 spend that money that they they think that they may not have. Don't be poverty, you know. Don't have a poverty mindset and invest in yourself, man. When you hire a coach, you're betting on yourself. And I just I just I wish more people would would follow your path. Um, and I think I think again for you, you know, I think this speaks a little bit to your leadership qualities that. You know, it takes humility for a guy like you to 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 have a coach. I think, um, and it's funny. It's as I was talking, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm writing down things that how I perceive you, and I think you know, I, I wrote down humble, I wrote down leader. You know, um, you, clever. There's all sorts of things. Um, all right. Well, listen, we always ask for a book recommendation, so I want to know what a guy like you reads. Now, I will tell you, you can't. You can know Keller Williams books. I know you're a kid. I know you, and you mentioned the one thing that's a great book by Gary, but I, that too many people say Gary books. So, um, here's the setup, Lance. I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book do I need to go buy today? Um, the book that we just got done reading as a team, uh, was the book called good to great. Yeah. Um, by Jim Collins, absolutely amazing book. Um, th- th- that's been the cool thing this year. We've looked at reading books as a team, and then on a weekly basis, we discuss those books. The next book that we're going to be reading is Top Dog by uh, Paul Bronson. Um, we just got done reading Positioning, and we in the beginning of the year, we read the book Shift because I anticipated that we were going to be getting into a shift very quickly here. And it has happened um, that we've shifted from a seller's market to a buyer's market, and it's happening very quickly. So it was really cool to read that book in the beginning of the year so that we were prepared for the, the shift in business. Got it. That's awesome. Again, you looking forward. I'll tell you, I'll, 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 you know what book, the two books that I have gone through recently that I love that I think you and your team, I'm just, just a suggestion for me to you. Um, but the ultimate sales machine by Chet Holmes is, I don't know if you've read yep. that. It's a great book. Um, and right now I'm going through the, for the second time. Um, um, oh my gosh. I'm actually interviewing this guy next week. Uh, hold on, hold on. How to pitch anything, uh, how to pitch anything. I can't believe I'm, I'm literally going to this guy's office and I can't Orrin Claff. How to Pitch Anything by Orrin Claff. That's a great book all about – it's all about sales. It's all about – it's about framing. It's about being able to put people in your frame where you want them. Um, so that's my suggestion to you. And everybody out there, if you haven't read any of those books, you know, Good to Great by Jim Collins, Ultimate Sales Machine or, or Orrin Claff's book, go get a free copy on us. Just use our Audible link, audibletrial.com slash Live. Um, all right. Hey, listen, fabulous conversation, Lance. I really appreciate it. And look, here's what I encourage my audience to do. If they've gotten anything out of this, to reach out and say thank you to you. And look, maybe somebody's hearing this and they're like, oh, I got to work with that guy. Um, so where can people find you, Lance? Um, my email address is lance at the and it's L-O-K-E-N. Um, and we're in the Houston market. Um, and we cover all nine counties. But it's Lance at the Loken Group dot com and anytime somebody needs help we're happy to help them out awesome and listen everybody you're going to want to remember that and just if you're walking your dog driving to work whatever all the stuff will be on our show notes just go to superagentslive.com and uh, and look for lance looking hey lance listen i, I want to be the first one to kick off that thank you train I, I know you're busy. You have big goals. I really appreciate you uh, taking time out of your busy day and sharing with me and your audience. My pleasure. It was great meeting you. You Thank too, you. buddy. All right. Let's, let's keep in touch. Okay. See you. See you. Bye-bye. Let's go. Yeah.